Hey, what's going on everybody? This is Joshua Ingles and I'm here with Justin Cross. If you don't know Justin, he has absolutely crushed it in the real estate industry and has gone to multiple different industries uh, from music to custom clothing. Um, just an all around great dude. Uh, ran a successful real estate broker, so I'm really excited. Thank you, Justin, so much for agreeing for this interview. Yeah, glad to be with you. Absolutely. <laughs> so let's start about real estate. Let's yeah. go back in time uh, a little bit to your first deal in real estate. Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, I was out in the West Coast and I was driving around. I just read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I, I know a lot of you have all checked out and been influenced by or inspired by. And kind of had it in my mindset that if a deal came one day, it was going to be about you know using other people's money and trying to put it together, right? And so there was a gentleman that I was out in at that time, uh, I guess you would call it the ministry, and he was disturbed because his buyer backed out. Mm. And I asked him, why are you essentially, you know, so heartbroken about something? And he said, well, this guy's leaving about $48,000 on the table of this amazing transaction. And so I was immediately like, oh, I'll buy it. I, I barely knew how to say those words yet because I hadn't done anything in real estate. I didn't have my license at the time. And I just figured in my head, my only logical piece, Josh, was is if, if he's half wrong, half of 48,000 is 24. Yeah. So that's more than I make in a year yeah. currently, right, at the time. This is a couple decades ago. Um, and so I said, I'll try it. And I didn't actually even know how I was going to fund it, honestly. I had no idea. And he's like, well, what's your credit score? And I told him, you know, I never missed a payment in my life. And I did what some of your viewers will know is a stated income loan back in the early 2000s. You really only need two to, two things. You just needed to lie about your income <laughs> okay. and have really good credit, Yeah. right? Let's be honest, right? And that's, what, that's where the subprime market collapsed. And so I ended up being able to acquire the property and we immediately relisted it and sold it. And I made exactly tw almost $28,000 on the deal. So you hit, you hit that half number that you... Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, just about, awesome. yeah, give or take, yes. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that's pretty awesome. So. You had a stated income loan. Mm -hmm. Did you do any work to the house too? None at all. It was new wow. construction. Okay. Yeah, new construction. And I, and I did watch how fast they were being bought and how fast they were being resold as the phases were released. Yeah. And so I just took a chance on it and I did the best I could with homework. It was more emotional. Yeah. And to be honest with you, uh, looking back, I would, I would honestly probably not do that deal now sure. uh, just because it's too speculative. But at the time, I think probably a moral of the story for your, your uh, listeners too, Josh, is that sometimes you have to take a plunge and you got to start somewhere, yeah. uh, even at the risk of failing. Because like since then, obviously, there's been several deals I've done that haven't worked out at all. I've either broke even or lost money on. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you got to start somewhere. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so just so we're clear, what you were doing is, so let's say phase one, you get in at really good pricing. Phase two, it's more pricing. And exactly. so you were speculating that, hey, by the final phase, this thing is going to be worth X. Yeah, and I wish I could even take that much credit, but the, the realtor slash guy that I was with was explaining that to me. And I was like, sounds good. Uh, <laughs> sure. You know, yeah. like... I did the best I could to try to understand it, but uh, sometimes that is the power of real estate at the end of the day. Sometimes it's just about acquiring the asset, having a plan for it. Yeah. And uh, my friend once said to me, you can give somebody a slam dunk real estate deal and they can completely screw it up and lose money. But you also can give a seasoned investor a really troubled project and they can turn that bad boy around and turn it into a gold mine. Yeah, that's very <laughs> true. So that was your first deal. So that just, I guess after that, you got pretty, pretty excited making uh, 20 some thousand. What, yeah. what were you doing for income at that time? Yeah, so it was a combination of things. So the segue was, uh, I, had, I had a really odd job, so I'll tell you about that. Uh, the first thing was, it was like, well, how can I replicate this? So I went and got my real estate license. And of course, everyone, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, coming out of real estate school, thinks like, oh, I got my license now. I'm just uh, start slinging some real estate, it's gonna be great. And then you hit a wall and you kind of realize how challenging it is. So I had an opportunity at a wedding in the Midwest. And this guy said, I'm building this company called Earth Balloon. And you can still check it out, earthballoon.com if you want just to have some fun. It's basically traveling around the nation in a giant inflatable globe. Okay. And you sit on the inside on top of Antarctica and teach kids with digital satellite photos on the inside of the globe all about earth science. Wow. And all I would have to do was learn a 20 minute presentation to give an in-house field trip to these kids. So I was doing that part time, traveling all around the United States. I went to 44 states in four years. Wow. And I got to give these little like really fun, kind of interesting earth science type of programs. Really cool. And then meanwhile, I was studying about real estate because I wanted to get back to that spot where I was making 
you know, twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year, a year's wage at that time was a lot for me. Yeah. And I only had to do one deal. That was the math, right? It was like yeah. one deal equals this. So how can I replicate that? And so the passion was there. And then I just started kind of like piecing the plan together. And what that really meant was like learning which brokerage to align myself with and you know like what would be what would become the plan i started dabbling in a little bit of property management because that was like a fast you know unit experience where i could at least quickly you know get some experience yeah. and then um, i started realizing quickly i put together a lot of um, investment proposals and the big break that i had and this would be very inspiring for everybody to hear the big break that i had josh was when people wouldn't invest in what i sent them because what happened was i bought them I ended up saying like, I'm just gonna get the money and just buy them myself because I spent all this energy packaging the investments up. And I was saying like, look at all this data, this is gonna work. And admittedly, my weakness and my inability to present it properly for someone to wanna fund it resulted in me being like, I know this is gonna work and trusting my intuition and I had a couple of home runs there and and then I was able to kind of fund a a traditional real estate brokerage and I, I realized that I could start a brokerage, I could start doing traditional buyer and selling, so I started like driving people around, you know, helping them out. And then my now ex-wife was down in, is up in Boston when we were living there, it was too cold. Mm -hmm. So she wanted to move to a super hot market. 2005, Charlotte, North Carolina, piping hot. 2005, Charlotte, North Carolina, piping hot. So a builder approached me and he said, hey look, I'm building all these homes. Would you like to learn the development process and help me buy these infill spec lots all in the urban uptrending areas near downtown Charlotte? And that's when I learned how fast real estate can explode when you purchase real estate that's kind of close to something that's relevant, in this case, downtown Charlotte. So we would purchase in these like transitioning neighborhoods and we, I could not believe where I would see like, oh my, we acquired that lot for next to nothing. We, we, our, our acquisition cost was this, our build cost was this. The turnaround time to build it was this amount of months, and then there's this massive margin there, yeah. right? So now I was like really intrigued, and it opened up this whole repertoire. And he also taught me how to finance those. Nice. So now I had this kind of spectrum of like a little bit of buyer and seller agency. I had bought a few investments myself, and now there was this consistent development developer business model where you could acquire land. And I I built a company called Sir Land a Lot. Nice. Okay, and the idea was, you know, there was a knight on, on, in, in the logo and all I was doing was acquiring these type of uh, lots, just like Anthony talked about today in the presentation where his, his acquisition is a specific type of luxury type of lot and he's building these big homes. Mine was that on a smaller scale, but that was, that was the nutshell of like my sort of transition into having my first like six figure breakout year it was a combination of uh, selling those development properties um, acquiring a couple of investments on my own, and then I learned the magic of holding a couple, yeah. selling a couple. And by the way, note to note to self, right? Like in the Carolinas, one of the beautiful things is these homes are 50 grand, 80 grand, 90 grand. And the relevance of that is that it's such a low margin risk for like investors to invest in that like I was able to acquire multiple units. And what that did was teach me how when you're spaced out all over the map you're noticing that different pockets escalate in value and you can liquidate high and balance off the other Mm. parts of your portfolio. So now things started to really round out and I said like, this is gonna be a career for sure. Yeah, Mm -hmm. awesome. So, man, that's great. So did you at that, also you were attracting agents to come work in your broker. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about that. How are you attracting people to come come work for you? Sure, to be completely honest with you, it was honestly just like word of mouth Mm -hmm. and at first, because I didn't picture myself honestly at, at all as being like a leader or someone that was like, if you will, qualified to like build a structure around it. So the informal approach was like, listen, could I get really good at just mentoring what I knew and just helping that way. I wasn't strong on systems yet. I didn't understand at the time that within a structure of a business, you have to have systems and protocol and a human resources department, a legal department, an IT department, a web department. The main focus, Josh, was like, "Can can I help this person go have an awesome career like me and just participate a little bit on their earnings? Yeah. That was my entire business plan. Sure. And that business plan produced only about two or three agents that worked out. I had about five or six that kind of came and went, and I quickly realized that even when you teach somebody what you know, there's just A players, B players, C players, D players, and some I take accountability for that I probably just didn't teach well enough, and they just don't do anything, work out, don't sell any real estate. Yeah. 
And then I realized when you have a rock star that comes in and starts slinging real estate, you need to appreciate them and you get humbled when they leave you and I experienced that. So then I kind of got a feel of what the brokerage was and I was able to make enough money off a few agents where I then started buying systems where I had coaches that already had built brokerages. Yeah. And there's a lot of independent, you can, there's a million people to Google that you know, can help and maybe you even offer products like that, I'm, I'm not even sure, but I started kind of looking at existing models and just saying what model makes sense and I just kind of explored the real estate brokerage thing and I think for about nine years I had Cross Realty uh, was my brokerage, my last name, and um, you know, I just flushed it out, held on to the best agents, hired a couple of full-time admin people and uh, I know this sounds really strange to your listeners, but uh, most of them worked out of my house because I had a big house and we just kind of like came and went and um, I didn't even need to have like the overhead of like a big office and stuff like that and we were really niched up and a lot of them just kind of like helped with whatever stuff I had going on. So that was the nutshell of kind of how we segued that. Cool. So we talked about you starting out, your brokerage. Tell me about some of the real estate deals that you've done as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, I would just say at the top of my head that uh, one of my favorite ones that really taught me a lot about uh, being patient with negotiations is I had acquired two lots. And again, I wish I could take credit for this. It's just the power of real estate. But I noticed that a developer was buying up a lot of lots in one particular area. And it was all this urban uptrending area near downtown Charlotte. And the land was zoned industrial. And this is what taught me to pay attention to zoning. I noticed that he was buying these lots at you know a pretty good price. And so I acquired one from an old buddy who had bought a bunch of lots and he was just like, you know, oh sure, if you want that one off of Turner Avenue, that's fine in Charlotte. I think it was 413 Turner Avenue in Charlotte, North Carolina. And then I noticed a tax foreclosure came up. I was watching my tax foreclosures and I think it was the one that's next to it. It's like either 419 or 417 or something. And I said, man, imagine if I could buy both these industrial lots maybe something good would happen because the price was so cheap. So I went down to the tax office, I bought that one. My total cost was uh, 13,000 plus 30,000. So I was all in at around 43 with closing costs. Let's clean it up to 50, okay? And long story short, I approached the investor directly, sent him an email and just said, hey, look, I just noticed you're buying a lot of real estate. I noticed that consistent deeds are coming through in this, this name of yours, are you interested? He says, he writes back this sort of like, yeah, sort of, I'll make you this offer, right? He's like, at first he's like, 60 grand. And I'm like, yes, 10K spread, minimum worst case scenario, right? And I was thinking in my head, let me counter back with like, maybe like 80, right? Yeah. And I just told him like, you know what? Let me just think about it. And then I went on vacation. Just so happens the timing went like that. And I was just like, I bought these lots so cheap, Josh. I was like, maybe I should just hold them. And so I wrote back like, hey, you know what? I just decided to kind of hang tight for a little bit. But the truth is, I just wanted to join my vacation. Yeah. What do you think happened? It's blowing you up. Blew, he blew me up with an offer for well in excess wow. of, of close to $150,000. Wow. And, he's, and he said the offer is good. I don't want to mess around. Give me those lots. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And so, and so I'm, that was my most massive deal with, with doing nothing. I mean, yeah. I, just, I just acquired these things. And again, I just kind of follow my instinct. A yeah. lot of real estate is genuinely common sense. And when I say common sense, like I, I'm not a qualified person. You heard my story today. My, my background is, is not finance, it's not business. Um, I came up as blue collar as you possibly could be. I, in fact, I was literally encouraged not to be entrepreneurial, quite literally, because of my upbringing, my religious strict upbringing. So that's just probably like one of my favorite deals. Uh, just like took next to nothing and, and made a great profit. And actually, Professor Moore and I, we bought a short sale house for 13. We sold that for 60. That was amazing. Nice. And then I actually got the record back in 2000. I think it was eight. I bought 1709 Newland Avenue for $4,000 on the MLS. And I sold it to a, a, a large Mexican family. There was like seven or eight of them. And they could barely speak English. And we went to a Panera Bread. And the reason I'm telling you the story is the deal almost fell apart for an interesting reason. They were paying cash. They didn't believe the price was so low. Oh, wow. I, they, yeah. they actually told the Spanish realtor, her name is Belinda Augusta, and, they, and, and she said, Justin, they don't believe in you because the price is too inexpensive. And I said, do you want to just do 35 or something like that? And then she finally convinced them to just pay 27. <laughs> but I bought the house at You're 4, like, I'll 000. sell it to you for more if you want. <laughs> it, exactly, exactly. So those are just some highlight of deals and with some actual addresses that people can look up and stuff yeah, like that. So, that's yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks, man. So um, so let's talk about that. So you were. it sounds like you're doing a lot of wholesaling. What about 
did you do any development yourself as well? Yeah, this story is, I got a little bit of a sad ending though because it was one of the most painful financial experiences of my life. Um, I did have some success buying some lots, building out with the, with the cost as they should be, and I sold them a good 30% to 50% margins on a few projects. And then uh, probably the one I want to tell that will be the most relevant is uh, the, what I call the Reed Avenue project. I bought three lots and I was building three at the, at the same time. They were infill lots, mm -hmm. okay? They were kind of like spec builds. Yep. And I really believed in the area and I thought I had the vision right and I did. Here's the problem, the crisis happened of 2008. Boom, market crashes, right? So check this out. I get a letter from SunTrust Mortgage. I open it up and it says, Dear Justin Cross, we just met with our annual credit advisory risk assessment council, and we've decided that we cannot release any more draws on your construction project, and we're pulling your funding. Uh, it was not personal. Uh, my actual reaction was literally laughter, uh, simply because that was so painful that it was like, I'm gonna go ahead and just laugh because I literally can, I don't even know, this is like, this is like serious, there's a lot of money, it's gonna be, it's gonna be up for grabs here, because they were literally like, all I had done was put up the framework mm -hmm. and they were just starting to get roughed in, yeah. uh, get running electrical and stuff. And so I was like not even, I was like right around halfway done with three homes at the same time. And this was also in an area where crime was pretty consistent. And so I would have to barricade them and it was just an awful situation. And so the reason I even like tell that story is that they ended up still getting sold and I broke even but I learned so much. Mm -hmm. I learned about how to make sure your projects are fully funded and to have a backup plan, you know, as far as that goes. Um, but, you know, also just to tell wins and losses. Yeah, no, you can't, you can't win them all, especially uh, <laughs> if, you, if you are, I'd like to meet you if you've done over 100 deals <laughs> yeah, and you've yeah, never lost money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, how, are, how are you financed? So, that I, obviously there, you're using just traditional financing. How, yep. You were obviously doing real estate after the crash yeah. as well. How are yeah. you financing stuff after the so crash private, and banks weren't lending? Private money, uh, another great story for everybody here, uh, making your enemies your friends. So I would go to the tax office and I kept getting my butt kicked by some somebody called TPM Properties. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, who is TPM Properties, man? These guys are monsters, buying up everything. I, I Googled them. They got over 500 properties in Charlotte. Wow. And they were just private. And I was like, who are these cats? They're monsters. So finally, I met Tom Paul Moore. Okay. TPM. He, TPM. You got it. And he comes up to me and we're bidding against each other and he goes like this. He goes, hi, Justin. And he's got this handshake that about breaks your hand. He's 75 years old, Josh. Yeah. This guy is so incredibly rock star because he's so humble. You would never know it. Multi, multi-millionaire. I went to his house later when we would go into the silver market together and he's got this mansion, but he drives a beat up old truck. And, it, and the point of the story is, Tom had been buying real estate for about 35 years in Charlotte. Mm. And he was so relaxed. I was so afraid to meet him. That's the point of the story, yeah. I was so afraid. And he already met guys like me and he knew who the players were that he needed to deal with. Yeah. And here's what dealing with us meant. This is what, he, this is what the inside story was. He would go on to fund over 30 deals with me wow. in the future. Okay, just him alone. Perfect. Now, if he couldn't buy the property himself, he would allow me first right of refusal on whatever I wanted to, but he had a loan structure in place. So he would benefit on every address oh, yeah. that was hot. So he would say, if you want this one, Justin, I'm gonna write the check for it. And we got to a point, Josh, where I would just give him an address. I would say, I've got, I'll give you the real address that he funded for me, I would say, I got 2049 Camp Green Street, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28208. And he'd say, we'll do that, 165. Yeah, we'll do that one. That was it. And, and he would say, okay, okay, Justin, we'll do that one. You want to have Tommy Jr. write up the paperwork? That's what it would sound like. That's my best terrible Charlotte accent. <laughs> but he had a son named Tom Jr. And Tom Jr. would just call me up and we would just do all the paperwork. And they put up with my Yankee ass because, you know, I'm from up north and I'm always like, hey, hey, what's up? And they're, and they're yeah. just kind of all chill. But we, they would go on to, to, to fund a ton of my deals and they, they bailed me out on, on a few deals. And to this day, we're good friends. And, and if I call them up and I want to do a deal, That's I awesome. still feel very confident that we can, you know, do business whenever. So. That's incredible. Yeah.
Yeah, that's a great relationship. Sometimes you never know. Obviously, he was probably uh, watching you for a while before he exactly. even did any business with you. That's exactly right. And yeah. he saw me succeed, too. Yeah. I would buy, and then I would win, and then, I would, and then he would put it up on the MLS. And, and I was also getting offers from them. So my company mm. was listing the properties, and here he was. And I saw what he was paying. Yeah. And I was like, this guy's got cash. Yeah. I was like, man, I, I was wanting to buy this property. He's, he's 20K over what I'm offering. Yeah. So we had to work something out. He was a competitor that I had to come in alignment with. Yeah. or I was going to have a really tough time. So that was a key play. I'm a big proponent of if you can't beat them, join them. And, yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> yes, strategically uh, work together. That's great. Yep. So let's start talking about uh, some of the other things you're involved with. We'll uh, talk about some of the music because I know yep. uh, the bass, bass guitarist I yep. initially and now yep. also you play uh, regular guitar, electric guitar. Exactly. Yeah. What do you prefer, bass or uh, yeah. Right now, uh, it's just exclusively guitar because that's where I write the melodies on. I'm a yeah. singer-songwriter, and so I'm able to do more dynamic stuff and kind of like the song structure takes form faster with the guitar. Yep. And so that's what I do. If you guys want to check me out on Instagram, it's at Justin C. Cross. That's actually my music uh, Instagram or whatever. You can hear some of what the stuff sounds like, whatever. But um, yeah, I as you kind of heard in the presentation today, I started when I was younger at like around 19. but. Then for religious reasons, I didn't even play at all for a whole decade. And then I picked it back up just a couple years ago and um, been kind of putting out singles. And I was fortunate enough to get some commercial success when some guys on the West Coast in, in LA liked some of the songs and wanted to use uh, the entire uh, scoring of a film. It would be exclusively music that I would write for the film. And um, it really helped me feel like I had started to really like got some you know grip. And then I also had a big break when I released one single called Fiction of the Mind. And that one single, I got an email from a friend and she said, you know, you're, you're featured in Grammy Magazine. Wow. And I was just shocked. And uh, if you go to like Grammy.com, you can look it up and, and you'll see that in last year, I think it was July article, I'm featured as 15 records you need to hear now. And awesome. uh, I, I remember the moment of scrolling down and seeing Nine Inch Nails and Kesha. Wow. Arcade Fire, Tyler the Creator, and then there's my name, Justin Cross. Oh my and, gosh, and all so, monster names. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, just getting some momentum, incredible. Josh, you know? Yeah. So, and so that's where I'm at, even with the music career now. I still play music um, at the end of the day. You know, you're only as good as your like recent success story, but yeah. I've been also kind of focusing on uh, the luxury men's, you know, suiting and stuff like that. So. Yeah, so let's jump into that too. Sure. Um, so I know you're uh, part of business development for, for men's custom suits and the luxury yeah. Uh, markets. So tell me a little bit. I know you've done even Bill Maher's suit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so tell me about that and what uh, what you're doing with that and why. Of course. Yeah. So uh, when I went to LA, the the idea was like, how can I meet people? How can I build my Rolodex? How can I also learn another market? I mean, a, a lot of uh, really successful entrepreneurs they're in multiple different market spaces. And so I kind of came to an aha moment when I realized like real estate's taken a lot of my time and life energy. And so it would be great to kind of diversify and at least have an awareness of a business that could help diversify my knowledge of other markets. And quite frankly, I didn't want to, you know, go to my grave without knowing how a product based sort of manufactured product based uh, business model worked. Mm. And so I had a combination of factors that a uh, chance meeting as well that led me to a guy who said, I picked him up actually, and he was like, hey man, just in you know everyday conversation, he said, I'm opening up this company, you know, if you wanna help, that, that might be something we could, we could use. And I said, with my background, I feel very confident I could help. And so a couple months went by and I got the call from the president of a company called Balani Custom Clothiers in West Hollywood. And they said, hey, if you'll have us, let's, let's see what we can do, let's, let's meet. And we actually met, we talked. And it was clear that I would be able to not just learn the process of the custom suiting, which also always fascinated me because as a performer and an artist, I like style and I like to understand how to create style. And I feel like long term it will uh, affect me when I go to actually create different outfits if I want to, if I want to perform, stuff like that. So I saw a lot of synergistic ways to, in the luxury space, you know, meet influencers, meet celebrities and be able to interface with them, things like that. And also just be able to you know, bring joy to guys' lives when they see themselves light up when they wear the right colors to really yeah. bring out things as simple as their skin tone or their eyes or their hair and look next level and be able to build a complimentary wardrobe. It's exciting and it's fun and guys love it. It's a gentleman's game. You know, you're, you're doing scotches and swatches and, and you're learning about the cloth and the fabric and drinking scotch and, and you know, smoking cigars and stuff. It's just a very man, masculine, you know, sort of experience. 
And so we opened up the doors in November of last year. We just celebrated a year of me being at the company and our you know one year november's coming up in what two months now and we went from you know basically zero employees all the way up to four and uh right now for for that that quick of a trajectory it turns out there's actually pretty rapid growth rate in a market like west hollywood which is a very expensive uh you know area to be in and we have a beautiful showroom right in sunset plaza and i've gotten to know all of the tenants in sunset plaza so all the businesses there the really high-end fashion district uh, area it's been good for like learning about who's you know doing what and, and who's having fun with life and it's a very creative thing there's there's a car i see every day over three hundred thousand dollars that makes me just get inspired josh yeah. that's all it does it, it makes me appreciate who worked so hard to get that and i have deep respect for the entertainment industry as well and so i get to you know meet a lot of people that are making things happen in that space and monetizing that you know when we we come from a real estate background and we can we can quickly understand the transaction of real estate but the art and science of the way an entertainment project is funded is so emotional and romantic yeah. in concept and it has so many moving parts it's been really fun to be able to also kind of dip a toe into that space and just be looking around and so that's just been a, a really fun experience and, and just overall kind of rounded out the ride if you will yeah i couldn't imagine just the people that you meet uh through that and like mm -hmm. you said you're 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 focusing on those high-end clients which yeah even if you continue to do real estate and you're going to continue all right, i know we're here in jamaica right now <laughs> and you said you just closed on a i think a land deal was it yeah a property a property uh, from an area that i've been investing in since 2005. i bought um uh, 1821 camp green street if you look at the deeds my company milestone resource and nature fuels bought that property in uh, 2005. Yeah. And so I'm just closing on that and you know, it's gonna free up a little bit of cash and stuff like that. So it's been nice to see that vision finally come through. It took a decade, but that's yeah. how real estate is. You know? That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just the high profile clients you're meeting. What, how can people learn more about, uh, and, and if you're watching now too, and you're watching the video version of this, He's not in a suit now, because obviously we're on the uh, beach, but he is fly. Yeah. <laughs> you are the uh, definition of GQ, and you got great Thanks, swag. Man. Appreciate it, brother. <laughs> and uh, beautiful suits uh, every day. I, I definitely appreciate suits. You saw me in a tux yesterday. Oh, yeah, that was too much fun, Josh. <laughs> you brought the party, man. That was beautiful. And if you want to check out at Justin underscore custom, you can see some of my work there, some of the people that I've actually interfaced with, and some of the guys I've actually suited up. Uh, that we were kind of talking about uh, NBA players, uh, NHL players, NFL players. Uh, just kind of exciting to see that all come together. So I'm stoked. Yeah, that's awesome. So, what advice would you give someone that um, it doesn't have to be real estate? Maybe they want to get started in, in business, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, they want to ditch their nine to five job, yeah. uh, but they don't know where to start. What advice would you give that person? Yeah, uh, first thing to do is, is sit with the reality that sometimes you may have to have a nine to five. Sometimes you might have to have that transition period, of course. But the biggest thing is, 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 I, is I always say, get out there and fail. And what I essentially mean is like, this is a, the entrepreneur life is definitely a highly complex game that you have to wanna play because it makes sense for you. And eventually you have to, uh, there's a certain company that's coined this phrase, just do it. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, my biggest advice is, with all that being said, find what you are really passionate about and what, how passionate it is, a way to kind of figure that out is, what are you willing to stick with continuously for a long period of time, knowing that you will work killer hours for whatever this passion is and you'll be willing to have the humility to learn over and over and over again through failures and some big time successes, what it's gonna to take to stick with that to, until you monetize it, until you see the profit margins, that you're willing to pivot with the marketplace and you're then able to envision eventually getting it fully funded and leverage yourself through other people. And so that's a convoluted kind of long-winded answer, but this is the key. What are you that passionate about? Honestly, you're not gonna make it and you're gonna fail if you're not super passionate about Absolutely. whatever you're thinking of doing entrepreneurially. If, for example, real estate, if you think it's sexy or you don't think it's sexy, you better be at least passionate about money, so passionate about money that you wanna do it. If you're passionate about real estate, let's say you absolutely love a brand new house and you love the idea of selling the beauty of it, that's, a, that's enough as long as it's gonna stay consistent or congruent with your vision and your lifestyle. But at the end of the day, you need to do a really honest audit of yourself 
are you passionate enough to be long longevity? Are, do you have the sort of like long view of whatever your vision is? That, that's probably the biggest thing for me because even when I've been really successful and I'm looking at my bank account, like I can't believe I got that many zeros in my bank account right now. Whenever I lost passion, you end up losing. You end up losing faster than you can imagine. Um, so that's kind of that's the biggest thing is if you get nothing else out of that, is just make sure you got the passion part right where Absolutely. you'd basically be willing to beat on a drum for years until this thing pops off. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are, I think, are attracted to business because mm -hmm. they're attracted to the lifestyle mm -hmm. that it can provide them. Yes. But then once they actually get into it, they realize, well, to get to that point, you're yeah. going to have to put in the work. You're going to have to put in the hours, mm -hmm. the blood, sweat, and tears. Yes. So, Justin, uh, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you uh, mm -hmm. if they want to learn more about you, sure. uh, connect with you? Sure. Uh, if you want to go over to justincross.com, I just threw up a little site that has a little portfolio stuff on there, and there's a contact uh, page on there. So go to justincross.com, or if you're on any of my Instagram accounts, I do a pretty good job at least once a week of checking the uh, sort of like unread messages folder. And if you have any slight articulation there at all, I'll be able to know you're a real human, and I'll do my best to you know, point in your direction if you're looking for consulting or business consulting or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that'll do. <laughs> Absolute pleasure, brother. Thank hey, you man. again. Really appreciate hey. you doing this interview. Keep crushing it. You too, Josh. Thank you, sir. All right. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you soon. Bye.